just a quick uh, introduction. Amanda is assistant professor at uh, and professor of modern and contemporary art at the University of Guelph. Her research and publications focus on contemporary art and theory and criticism with an emphasis on the intersection of the biological sciences, visual technologies, and artistic practices of the late 20th and the early 21st century, centuries. Her, her first book, Ethics of Earth Art, uh, is from 2010, uh, U, U Minnesota. Analyzes the, the development of the earth art movement, focusing on how ecology became a domain of ethical and aesthetic concern. Her forthcoming book, Heidegger and the Work of Art, which is Ashgate uh, next year, I think, uh, is co-edited with Aaron Vinegar, explores the impact and future possibilities of Heidegger's philosophy for art history and visual culture. She's now currently writing a new book uh, titled Contemporary Art and the Drive to Waste, in which she analyzes the use and representation of garbage in contemporary art, and more subtly, how waste as such is defined, narrativized, aestheticized in the age of global capitalism. So, Amanda, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm last minute, but I have to say it's been a pleasure to be here so far. And um, despite the fact that I'm uh, going to be speaking about the relationship between uh, vision, visuality, and representation, I think that there are certain... Um, I wouldn't want to suggest that there are necessarily analogies between vision or uh, between... Uh, or, or between uh, we'll say the organs of vision and sound, uh, but I would like to propose, I think that would be going too far maybe, maybe it wouldn't, uh, but I would like to propose that at least there's certain cultural homologies between uh, that relationship between representation and um, uh, at the very least something like style. Um, some, some ideas that I would like to um, recall from yesterday that I think are parallel here, um, uh, maybe the idea of, uh, Marcus had mentioned the idea of um, uh, preparing, uh, preparing for experiential capability. And I think that there's, uh, there, I'm going to be talking about something similar, though, in terms of the idea of affordance. Um, Eldridge had mon uh, mentioned the idea of habits of perception and then kind of went on to talk about the loop as a, as a recursive priming. Uh, and and there's, uh, there's something similar that I'm talking about here, though priming uh, wouldn't be what we, I mean, I often associate priming with like before you paint your walls, there's a white ground, uh, but, but I think the way that you talked about it yesterday was a kind of uh, neurological gathering. And so when I talk about vision and visuality, it is as a kind of neurological gathering um, that I think happens in the work of art. Uh, and again, um, I will be talking about vision, but uh, you'll hear the ideas of attunement, uh, sampling, ambient surrounding, uh, all, with, uh, all, all as ways to parley through um, uh, vision, visuality, uh, and neurology. So that's my little, my little uncomfortable preface. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start with an artwork that uh, summarizes many of the points that I want to make. Uh, this is a sculpture by the German artist Marilla Neudecker, and it's called uh, 400,000 Generations from 2009. Uh, this was inspired by a study that showed how the microfibers of the retina have taken 400,000 years of environmental adaptation to evolve into the contemporary human eye. Uh, Neudecker constructed a pair of glass spheres that house what appears to be a microcosm of a cloudy mountain range, filled with a white solution that simulates the thick layer of mist and a fiberglass mold of blue mountain peaks. The work curiously resembles a pair of eyes in which the mountains double as the fibrous tissue of the retina. The spheres are part of a series of tank works in which the artist created illuminated ecosystems in which uh, can be related to uh, an emerging geo-aesthetics. For my purposes, though, I would like to highlight not simply the way they established a visualization and sensitivity to geological time and earthly transformations. Um, I mean, really, what more, uh, what could be said, what exterior is there but uh, geology, but that uh, planetary externality. Uh, so I'm suggesting that they create a sensitivity to that, but also how they situate human vision in the midst of and in response to those evolutions. That is to say that they don't simply visualize, but they advance a visuality, 
a circuitry between ecosystemic activity, the morphology of the visual organs, and representation. I'm working here uh, from Whitney Davis's definition of visuality as a way of seeing shaped in interaction with items of visual culture, and his suggestion that we need a model that accounts for recursions of visuality in natural vision. The work operates on two levels then. It imagines the shaping of vision and thematizes a particular visuality, what I would call uh, an ecologicity. And that's a term that I want to return to. So keeping this in mind, I'd like to outline the terms by which we might understand uh, perception in light, uh, uh, in light of um, this uh, politics of ecological being. and in light of the concept of speculation. Uh, in effect, I wonder how speculation can be tuned to ecology and how ecologic ecologicity is fundamentally speculative. So uh, I want to chart three tra trajectories, ecological perception, developments in neuroaesthetics, and the visualization of both in art. Each of these, I would argue, is a component part of an ecological consciousness that is currently being articulated in tandem with a neurological understanding of the transactions between the human perceptual system and the activity of non-human life. Further, I'm interested uh, to see how vision, oops, I went too far, how vision and <laughs> even the eye itself is a site at which these transactions are forged and radicalized. I'll start with some foundational ideas, and firstly with ecological perception. Uh, between the late 50s and early 70s, the cognitive psychologist James J. Gibson mobilized uh, a new phenomenological subject through the study of animal behavior and experiments that showed how we perceive ourselves and others coextensively with an environmental fabric, or what he calls the environmental niche. He showed how perception takes place through a continuous sampling of sensorial information conferred through what he calls the optic array of one's ambient surroundings. This takes place uh, in an ecology, a word which he interpreted to mean a constellation of objective conditions as well as mobile sensual effects that constitute the perception of a given environment. Gibson spearheaded the concept of the affordance, with its most mature development appearing in the ecological approach to visual perception in <coughs> 1979, uh, suggesting that we are continuously ascertaining the range of possible meanings and actions that an environment or an object yields, whether for good or ill. For example, a cave may afford shelter or a hidden threat. A bush covered in berries may afford nourishment or poison. Another animal may afford danger or opportunity to eat. Importantly, the affordance assumes that an environment and its meaning to the perceiver are inextricable. Uh, Gibson is specific that the affordance is neither an objective property nor is it a subjective property. It cuts across the dichotomy of subjective-objective, or as he puts it, the affordance is equally a fact of the environment and a fact of behavior. In this way, Gibson meticulously averts the risk that the affordance might simply be the mechanism by which one instrumentalizes the environment, that it might be re reduced simply to what an environment can provide for. One may or may not attend to the affordance according to one's needs, but whether or not one does, the affordance remains invariant. It simply is. It is not bestowed on an object by need of an observer through the act of perception. Simply, in Gibson's words, the, objects, uh, the object affords what it does because it is what it is. As the concept developed, uh, Gibson qualified that the affordance is an action possibility. So this is an idea that he, uh, that he uh, uh, defines and redefines. 
So ultimately, in a nutshell, he calls it the action possibility, thus making the claim that not only are perception and meaning coextensive, but meaning is understood in part as the bodily responses, experiences, and possibilities that an object or environment yields. Again, affordance is not just the yield, uh, nor is the notion of action possibility understood to infer the inevitability of the observer's behavior. The affordance of an object implicates it in any potential action that it may prefer the observer. A chair, for example, affords sitting, but it equally affords inserting one's arms, <laughs> lifting, and wearing like a shirt, as in the case of The Idiot, uh, a one-minute sculpture by the Austrian artist Erwin Wurm. Erwin Worm's uh, sculptures cinch together a ground between the banal object and a seemingly random or absurd gesture. They unearth the multiplicity of affordances of a given object, be it the potential to balance oneself on the head of a broom, uh, put one's head in a crate, insert asparagus in one's nose. Most importantly, these affordances are entirely unrelated to any need or function that one may have of them. The sculpture exists as a superfluous yield with no use value or, uh, or function. In this way, they thematize a relinquishment of a true belief in art or of any invested standpoint in the interpretation of the thing. Uh, not only do the sculptures deliberately refute the expectation of meaning, they express this refusal as a, problem, a problematization of the body and its gestures of interpretation that would put the thing in context. Or another way to put this is to say that it refuses to insist on the primacy of meaning to and in our world. In one case, a man's arms are immobilized in the arms of a chair. Another man balances on his head so that the chair may sit on him. Um, and another stopper, stoppers up all the orifices of his face with office supplies, a stapler in the mouth, two plastic containers for, uh, for photograph film in his eyes, two markers up his nose, and two pens in his ears. The sculpture as action possibility then suggests the idea that while a thing, an object, may yield a meaning, this is only one of many that is activated within a constellation of volatile conditions external to that, uh, to that object. It is neither singly meaningful, nor is it value-free. So the affordance is neither a right interpretation within a given context, nor is it relative and super-added. So in this way, affordance is a primary relation between the subject and the environment in a way that accounts for the limits and possibilities of both, and the fact that these are visible, built into the moment of perception. A more serious example, well, Irvin Berm is serious, but I'll say a more serious example of this that has stayed with me for some time comes from an essay by Francisco Varela about color vision in birds. Uh, the essay sets out the enormous range of perceptual capabilities of the bird eye in terms of color, uh, far beyond the range and subtlety of primate vision. And this is due to its finely honed uh, cones, rods, UV sensitivity, the cells of the optic tectum, and so forth. Varela uh, and his team of researchers go on to speculate regarding the role of color vision, most naturally uh, turning to its functional significance, but also shifting this phrase to consider that it has cognitive significance for birds. Surely, the sophistication of color vision is relevant to feeding, for example, in the identification of fruits and colored insects, but also to other behaviors such as mating rituals. The essay ends by suggesting that the cognitive significance of color may have an affective dimension that cannot be explained simply in terms of the discrimination of objects. I can only think of the mating ritual of the Australian bowerbird, in which the male builds uh, an elaborate nest to attract a female. 
the sheer diversity of configurations and colors have tempted ornithologists to consider that the nest has an aesthetic dimension, that it is an expression for the male, and that the female makes a choice, not simply in terms of the brightest or the most colorful, what best captures the eye, but an aesthetic judgment with criteria that are unknown to us, but deciding factors for her. So on the one hand, affordance is the fact of perceivable conditions and possibilities, which can sometimes be a chilling thought, an existential thought. It certainly would be for a beetle if it knew that its shiny carapace had caught the perfectly honed eye of a bluebird, that its image came to rest on the bird's retina like two pieces of a puzzle fitting together. And then, of course, gulp. Uh, but the, so in a way, the affordance is an existential net. On the other, when these facts of environment are also facts of a range of behaviors, affordance blooms and possibilities uh, become visible. The question is, to what extent are affordances visualizable? Which is to say, to what extent can an ecological perception become virtualized, represented, and returned to vision as a perceived condition or style of being. For after all, if there is any uh, project at hand to be taken up, and that I think is already being taken up, it is that of how to advance an ecological being. Uh, this means not simply to represent or picture a new world view, but rather to attune vision to an ecological reality. That's my crux. Uh, and it's here that representation enters the conversation. No, we're not there yet. <laughs> Gibson's work has had a profound impact in many domains, uh, from design and HCI, human-computer interaction, to art history, phenomenology, eco-criticism, and beyond. Uh, among these trajectories was his exchange with the art historian uh, Ernst Gombrich, with whom he debated the visual operation by which we perceive pictures, namely, what is their visual relevance? How do we see pictures differently from the ambient environment? What do we use pictures for? For his part, Gombrich came to think of the exercise of viewing art ethologically as a way of creating perceptual readiness. Uh, here we might think of experiential capability. Of, of significance here is the fact that Gombrich understood the perception of art as a process of cultivating visual skills of recognition in the eye, which is to say he identified a reciprocal relationship between uh, vision as such and visuality, uh, what might be more commonly uh, associated with style. In a nutshell, uh, art operates from visual schema that are geared to trigger pattern recognition, a skill that we have in spite of environmental variances. He uses the example of our capacity to recognize a face in a crowd, despite the fact uh, that that face is nested among fluctuating perceptual variables, and despite the fact that physiognomies are themselves entirely mobile, constantly configuring to express. We nevertheless have a framework of identity, uh, identity in change that is recognized throughout these transformations. Unnecessary, but I like to think that I could pick out uh, my cat among, <laughs> among others, and these are all different cats here, <laughs> among all the other buff-colored cats. I like to think that if I were <laughs> to confront a room filled with them, that I could find mine. I'm a little skeptical. There's a, there's, a, there's a kind of skepticism there. But maybe we could find one another. Here we can uh, detect the notion of affordance as both subjective and objective property. Uh, but from this, Gombrich goes on to explain what he calls the plasticity of vision. The fact that our codes of recognition can also be altered by representation. Thus, for example, a caricaturist captures the invariance of a character's features that are commonly recognizable, what he calls the visual code, but also pick out and magnify other invariants that are not used for recognition 
and focus our attention on these to the point where we cannot see the character in life without also thinking of the caricature features. The caricaturist does not teach us how to see, but rather a new code of recognition. A visuality has been nested into vision and vision trained to recognize a, vi to recognize a visuality. How can we see Hitler the same way? How can we see him not as hysterical after Chaplin? Many probably did anyway. <laughs> but there's no going back uh, after seeing Chaplin uh, bulb his eyes out like this. This claim has found its way into Michael Baxendahl's concept of the period I. For example, in the way he shows how the visual skills of a 15th century merchant to judge the size, volume, weight, and mass of things, and the coextensive reflex of seeing their value and cost, are echoed and elaborated in the simulations of volume and shape in the painter's perspective. In short, he wages an account of the historicity of visuality above and beyond the phenomenon of perceptual readiness so that we might think of art in terms of the variations and specializations that art receives and cultivates. The idea of a historical shaping of vision through visuality continues into the work of John O'Neill's, who parlays neuroaesthetics into a neuroart history. This is a new level of analysis, for whereas for Gibson, Gombrich, and Baxendahl, vision and visuality are defined through a broader framework of perception, which is to say, seeing and interpreting, Onions draws on the scholarship of Semir Zeki, who seeks to find the neurological correlate for aesthetic experience. <coughs> This scientific endeavor is still in its infancy, but perhaps does not stop us from responding to some of the implications that Onions <coughs> points to. Namely, that the production of art, whether an object, picture, an architectural design, and so forth, is an evolutionary product of visual adaptation to ecologies of visual affordance, such as topography, climate, flora and fauna, and to changes in these. This evolution, uh, what we might call a neurocultural evolution, can't be equated with the timeline of genetic evolution as we ordinarily think of it. As has been pointed out by multiple scholars, uh, our visualities, or period eyes, have changed many times over, far faster than the timeline of biological evolution could, could account for, though no doubt a neurovisuality could inflect that evolution. Evolutionary change aside, perhaps the specificity of neurovisuality, its historicity, responsiveness to ecological change, and interactivity with vision, allows us to mobilize the terms by which uh, to elaborate a perceptual system that is shaped by an ecologicity. To return to Neudecker's work, uh, what is so striking is not merely the staging of either the neurological function of the eye or its ecological responsiveness, though an analogy between uh, nerves and landscape uh, does do this. It is the way it coordinates the neurological, ecological scenario into a visibilization of a new sensitivity and one that has an ocular situation. What does this sensitivity <coughs> entail then? These are the terms and conflicts that give definition to a condition such as that of ecology. The concepts of diversity, complexity, climactic conditions, receptivity and change, and of course, the threats to all of these have an aesthetic realization as time, atmosphere, and the modulation of ethos in landscapes that are also inscapes, to borrow a term from Alfred North Whitehead. Ecological affordance becomes more than the perceptual scenario of oneself in the environmental niche. It coincides with a neurological extension into a planetary consciousness. 400,000 generations asserts an awareness of geological time, precisely as the idea of the Anthropocene began to gain currency. And it brings this awareness to bear on visuality now seen as a long-standing process of coextensive neural shaping. Retinal tissue is likened to earthly strata, and in the case of 24 hours, 48 hours, 1 plus 2, 
uh, nerves are likened to old growth forest, and earth is now uh, positioned as a fibrous feeling tissue. And where it might seem that this is simply making too much of the fact that the artist makes these in transparent bowls that look like eyes, I would make the same argument, uh, perhaps more so, about her tanks. Uh, this time with a view to considering how our vision, uh, and specifically how we, uh, how we understand our own vision, frequently depends on the concept of the screen. How am I for time? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thus, we can see um, this work. Things can change in a day. Uh, a tank work that looks like a three-dimensional illuminated screen. I suggest it's a screen because the effect of the glass flattens the microcosm into a pictorial image when we stand before it. We both look at an object, a micro world, in which the eye can detect contour, and at the same time picture that world as a totality a landscape, a place, an ancient ecology, or perhaps a fictional one. All this is underwritten with the timely nature of the title. Things can change in a day. Uh, it speaks to both the danger and the saving power of an ecological reality, that we have changed things irrevocably and have the power to do so at the drop of a hat, and at the same time that we are capable of sudden shifts in consciousness. The emergence of an ecologicity, it seems to me, uh, is not simply a matter of technological extension, so much as an internalization of consciousness through its visibilization. Um, Beth referred yesterday to this idea of the ingestion or incorporation of other beings, and I think this is quite significant in terms of elaborating the recursive operation by which we speculate through perception and representation, be it visually or sonically. Um, so this is a procedure that I would also call an aesthetic recalibration or attunement. In short, the awareness that comes with ecology is not simply seen, looked at, or imagined, but returned to vision as a sensible capability. In other words, along with the science of ecology, we have generated a host of information and knowledge that changes our understanding of ourselves. This runs from the level of epigenetics to climate change, geological transformation, and everything in between. For the most part, this knowledge is based on a worldview that is almost entirely imperceptible to the naked eye, but certainly technologically accessible. As Mark B. Hansen has pointed out uh, in New Philosophy for New Media, digital media overcome, bridge, and integrate these discrepancies. We might think of his example of the way a Bill Viola work makes machine time, the second of digital capture that is replete with far more information than one could ever process, available to body time, the average range of perception of the viewer. Certainly, the technological capacities of new media are part and parcel of ecologicity. But I want to underscore the claim that these capacities in and of themselves do not amount to much unless they are mobilized in and as a new capacity to sense, or as Gombrich puts it, a new code of recognition. Moreover, this way of sensing does not always have to be advanced in the vernacular of new media, though these capabilities do shape the visual field of ecologicity. In this way, a relatively low-tech practice like Neudecker's is as much a part of a speculative ecological aesthetics as the work of uh, the Harrisons, uh, the bio art of Eduardo Koch, or the tactical media of critical art ensemble. In fact, it may, develop, it may be developing a succession to visuality that is not yet integral to, or perhaps hasn't even been made explicit in those categories. What is made explicit, it seems to me, is the neurological dimension of ecologicity. I've often thought about the palpable gap between giving an account of artworks that are already fully historical, uh, historicized and contextualized, and those that are trying to shift the coordinates of art making and critical practice altogether where the former are anchored by assumptions of the work's contribution, whether stylistic, political, technological, or aesthetic, the latter emerge as a kind of clumsy bricolage of reflection, information, material, and perhaps political statement, 
buoyed by explanation that attempts to sew the different dimensions together, or concocted justification through an analogy between the intention and the practice. Early eco-art emerged from this kind of predicament, replete with scientific discovery, political righteousness, and good intentions, but somehow in its moment falling short of the domain of aesthetic coherence. Who wants a work of art to be like pouring through an encyclopedia of information, even if it is aestheticized information? And why should art be the space to inform people anyway? I always return to the question, what are we doing when we make art? Well, not me, because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> But all together now, <laughs> as, as humans, what are we doing? Explaining new media art can be similar, wading through a technological vocabulary just to get to the basics of medium, and then trying to identify what specific alteration the artist has made simply to get at the way a medium can be a message. Neurology and its technological correlates, uh, including art, overcome this exposure to the equipment, so to speak. Neuro, neurovisuality is the I know kung fu moment, just a moment, at the full conjunction of the biological sciences and art. And I'm repositing here, it is constitutive of an ecologicity. The work of Levi Van Vlu uh, gives an inverse view of this convergence. This time, instead of thematizing the eye as landscape, distributing the landscape onto the body in such a way that it is seemingly turned inside out and its neurological circuitry and, re um, and reaching dendrites double as trees, soil, and foliage. The artist made these by, uh, by actually applying these props uh, and photographing them, so they are also a kind of portrait. Again, what is curious is not just the visual analogy between neurons and ecological phenomena, but that these are mobilized for the viewer into an attunement. I cannot but see this body as neurologically primed. Moreover, this recognition is encapsulated by the consistency and intensity of the artist's own stare from one portrait to the next. So we are not just considering the ecologicity of the eye, we are asked to do so by mimicking this intensity of vision in the same moment we are struck by the uncanny textures, colors, and hues of the landscapes. To conclude, I want to uh, return to what I think of as the existential net of affordance, the fact of environment and the fact of behavior. The specific convergence that I've outlined here between neurology, ecology, and visuality that combine to become an ecologicity in art is nested within this predicament. Uh, though I haven't spoken much about the science of neurology, it will be a surprise to no one that its terms often give way to a kind of flourish or potential, as Varela does when he talks about the behavioral and affective dimension of color vision in birds. Neurology is thought through the concepts of plasticity, genetic expression, attention or inattention, the shaping of inhibition or disinhibition. These terms have integrated themselves into an episteme that ecology now shares, if it did not perhaps even initiate. But these terms are also aesthetic in nature. Uh, for my part, I would like to see them as political also, in that they are uh, ultimately the tools with which uh, future science, technology, and subjectivity, or post-subjectivity, will be forged. Thank you. Thank you.